Okay, good morning, everyone. I am really delighted to welcome you to the ninth plenary session of the 29th edition of the SSPH plus Lugano Summer School in Public Health. Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. I have the great pleasure of introducing you and to a, a fantastically brilliant person, uh, Dr. Rowena uh, Marit. She has extensive experience in, experience in developing, leading, and evaluating social marketing and behavior change programs all around the world. She did her PhD at the University of Oxford in 2006, and she was part of the original team that set up the National Social Marketing Center in London. This was the first national social marketing center in any country. Under her position at the center, she managed England's first multi-trial application of social marketing, involving 10 sites across England, each focused on a different topic and audience. She moved then to the Department of Health in England and developed national social behavior change strategy called Ambitions for Health. Since leaving the department in 2010, Rowena has uh, had many roles, including the head of research and evaluation at the National Social Marketing Center and worked on, uh, on a, many projects for development agencies, including USAID, World Food Program and international NGOs, including uh, WHO, uh, again, Un uh, World Food Program and UNICEF. Some of her work, just a sample of her, of her uh, work, includes the development of a new marketing code for breast milk substitutes, the Department of Health in Hong Kong, development of a training program for, environment, uh, for an environmental NGO in the Kingdom of Jordan, uh, funded by USAID, the development of a national campaign uh, for WHO in the Ukraine, and development of a social behavior change communication strategy for the World Food Program in Ethiopia. Uh, among, that's just a sample of her work. Um, she's uh, currently, in addition to her, her, her role as a consultant for many organizations, she is the senior advisor of consumer insights and social marketing at the NGO Site and Life. So with that, I'd like to welcome Rowena and ask you to share your screen. And I just make a, another announcement quickly. We have the Q&A feature open in the Zoom. And so as you have questions, feel free to type your questions there. And then when we move to the second part of the plenary where we, we'll answer those questions. So Rowena, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, Susanna, thank you. It always makes me feel really old when people talk about <laughs> what I've done. It makes me feel very old. Um, but thank you very much for that introduction. So hopefully you can all see my slides now. And today we're going to be looking at creating demand for public health goods and services. In the subtitle of if Coca-Cola did public health promotion, what would it look like? What would it be? So the current situation um, in relation to public health very much globally is that we produce lots of leaflets and posters telling people what to do, do this, don't do that. Sometimes the leaflets are just very factual, such as the one being coughing for three weeks, tell your doctor, very simple instructions. Sometimes they're very shocking or they show images that try and provoke a strong reaction. Many of the anti-smoking um, posters show pictures of blackened lungs or as you can see here quite strong images. And sometimes those posters are just downright awful and confusing. So you might be looking at this thinking what does it want me to do? Well it wants you not to be a cancer chancer i.e it wants you to get screened for cancer. And if you're thinking, but what cancers? Well, it's actually the three top prevalent cancers in the UK, which are bowel, breast and lung cancer. But yes, it's absolutely awful, let's be honest. So what often we do in public health is we make things boring. We just give facts and figures. We tell people the vitamin A content of a carrot. Nobody needs to know that in order to eat it. They just want to know that it's yummy and crunchy and fresh. We make things difficult for them. 
we tell young people, we want you to go for a sexual health screening. We want you to do a chlamydia test. But to do that, you have to phone up and book an appointment and the receptionist is really rude to you. And then you've got to wait three weeks for an appointment. And when you finally go to your appointment, before you can see the doctor, you have to fill out a really, really long form which asks you very personal questions and you have to detail every sexual partner relationship you have ever had. In relation to what else we do, we make things boring, difficult, and also often lonely. I worked at Department of Health England when smoke-free legislation came in. And though I was really happy because I hated smelling so bad after going to the pub, in fact, it made it really lonely for me because even though I worked at Department of Health England, the vast majority of my colleagues smoked and we would go to the pub on a night after work and whilst I sat at the table inside the pub all the smokers went outside to have a cigarette and they would come back in joking and laughing at, about some joke somebody had made and I felt really left out and really lonely. And the reality is the impact of our strategy just doesn't really work. Just giving people information, giving them facts and figures, just doesn't impact on ultimately behaviour change. The UK government spent a lot of money promoting five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. Now, if you ask somebody in the UK, the vast majority will know that we should eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. And yet, if you look at the graph, you can see that actually, our fruit and vegetable consumption, despite the campaign, has really not changed at all. We average 3.7 portions, apparently, of fruit and vegetables a day. So why don't these tactics work? Why don't giving these facts and figures and this information impact? And the reality is, it's because we're not rational. We don't make rational decisions. If we did, would anybody smoke? I imagine if you ask smokers around the world, is smoking bad for them? They would say yes. They might even know why it's bad for them or the negative impact it could have on their health, but they would know and yet still smoke. My children remind me every day that we're not rational. This is a picture of my youngest son called Fraser. In my house, I really try to focus on healthy eating. I cook everything from scratch. We have no processed foods. Um, if they want a sweet treat, it has to be all homemade. And despite this, my son's first word was cake. But to be honest, his love of cake is the least of my problems. When he was asked last week by his new form teacher what he wanted to be when he grew up, he said he wanted to be a Viking and that he was going to, and I quote, Alley to Calais so he could pillage a village. So as I said, cake eating is the least of my problems with this one. But my eldest son, Hamish, He's always been much more rational, much more health conscious, much more uh, thoughtful with everything he does. He reads Greek mythology books. He's teaching himself Latin and wants to be a history professor when he grows up. So I had high hopes for healthy eating with this one. And yet during lockdown, when he got his pocket money, he would cycle on his bicycle to the local corner shop. And with that pocket money, he wouldn't buy magazines anymore. He started to buy Coca-Cola. I was frustrated because he knows that Coca-Cola is bad for him. He knows that it will rot his teeth. And yet, this is what he told me. It makes me smile, mummy. That's why I drink it. I know it's bad for me, but it makes me happy. It makes me smile. And that made me think, well, how does Coca-Cola do it? Like really, it's just a black liquid made of chemicals that doesn't taste that great, and yet people associate it 
with happiness. And if public health, if Coca-Cola did public health, what would they do? How would they do it? What would it look like? So these are my thoughts. If Coca-Cola did public health, they straight away would make things fun. Their slogan at the moment is open happiness. Like, who doesn't want to open happiness? It's a fun, positive message. They would make things easy. It is so easy to get a Coca-Cola. I have climbed up mountains in the middle of nowhere in Ethiopia. And at the top of that mountain, I've been able to buy a Coca-Cola. I've not been able to buy water or any fruit and vegetables, but I have been able to buy a Coca-Cola. And they make it popular. They make it the social norm. They make it the cool thing to consume. So what if Coca-Cola did healthy eating? Well, maybe it would look like this. When you think exciting snack, baby carrots don't come to mind. Like most veggies, baby carrots lay forgotten in refrigerator crispers across the world. Of course, junk food doesn't have that problem. So how do we get baby carrots out of the bottom drawer and get people crunching them just like junk food? Now in extreme junk food packaging. Now in chic junk food packaging. Now in futuristic junk food packaging. If you're going to be like junk food, first, you've got to look the part. Baby Carrot's junk food packaging officially hit the shelves in select test markets, driving double-digit carrot sales in-store. But junk food isn't just sold in grocery stores, so we made our own junk food vending machines. A New York high school is encouraging kids to get food out of the vending machine because that machine has baby carrots in it. Now some schools are finding a new way to dump the junk. And all Baby Carrot's junk food packaging features a tout for the free iPhone app Extreme Crunch Cart, the world's first ever video game powered by crunching baby carrots into your iPhone mic. But you're not officially junk food until you've got your own over-the-top junk food commercials. Baby carrots, yeah, baby carrots, whoa, baby carrots. Baby carrots. Baby carrots. Extreme impossible stunt. Baby carrots. Baby carrots. Baby carrots. Extreme pterodactyl. Feel that feeling. You know the feeling. Overt sexual innuendo. Initiate crazy expensive special effects. Despite running in just two test markets to date, in Cincinnati and Syracuse, this $2 million campaign has garnered over 500 million PR impressions across the world. A high school in Ohio has installed an all-carrot vending machine. Has anybody ever called your penis a baby carrot? <laughs> oh, baby carrots. Baby carrots. Eat them like junk food. So hopefully you could see and hear that. We were having some technical issues um, earlier, but hopefully that's been resolved. So if Coca-Cola did healthy eating, they wouldn't talk about the value, the vitamins and minerals attached to eating products such as carrots. Instead, they would create demand by making healthy foods fun and cool and easy to access. They're in a vending machine next to the junk food. So what if Coca-Cola did road safety? Would they talk again about facts and figures? Would they show the, the bloody bodies of, of car crash victims or smashed up cars like we see with a lot of health promotional materials around road safety? Or would they do something more like this?
so there's no bloody bodies there, there's no smashed up cars. Instead, Coca-Cola would trigger our responses. They would trigger our responses in many ways. They would have very moving music going on. They'd have a little girl with fairy rings to kind of mean an angel coming to help you. They would basically trigger a positive emotional reaction instead of creating fear. Now, what would Coca-Cola do if they wanted to tackle environmental issues? I think environmental issues are one of the hardest areas to tackle in relation to this public health agenda that we work on. Often because public with environmental issues, it's full of scientists who like to talk about stats and science and everyday people like myself get really lost in it. They tell you about climate change, they tell you about hypoxia and rivers, and you just get lost in the science. But if Coca-Cola did environmental work, maybe they would do this. Spring rains in the D.C. area carry excess fertilizer to our sewers and rivers. It travels to the Chesapeake Bay where blue crabs have been rapidly disappearing. They suffocate slowly from lack of oxygen. No crab should die like this. They should perish in some hot, tasty, melted butter. So hold off in the fertilizer until fall, because ridding the planet of delicious backfin is just plain wrong. Spring. Coca-Cola would tell you to save the crabs, but not for an environmental reason, just because you can eat them and they taste really delicious. Basically, they're focusing on what people care about now, and that is eating a delicious crab. They also make change very achievable. They're not telling you not to fertilize your lawns because they know Americans love their green lawns. Instead, they're telling you to fertilize in the autumn. But just don't fertilize in spring, instead fertilize in the autumn. So they're giving you a really easy change that you can make where you don't feel you're actually losing anything. In fact, you've still got green grass, and you have delicious crabs. It's a win-win situation they're communicating. So this made me think, well, we have to promote a lot of services and a lot of public services that are always on the line. We're always wondering which public service is going to be cut next. So what would Coca-Cola do if they ran public services or if they had to save public services from being chopped because of money? financial limitations. Maybe they would do this. There once was a library, a beautiful, busy, award-winning library. Unfortunately, times were hard. The city of Troy, Michigan, no longer had enough money for its library. So it scheduled a vote, asking the townspeople to approve a small tax increase. This angered an anti-tax group known as the Tea Party. Well organized and well funded, they started posting vote no signs, mailing flyers, and making noise. They dominated the conversation, changing the topic from library, books, and reading to taxes, taxes, taxes. With no money and an election less than a month away, the library needed help. They needed something attention getting, audacious, maybe even vile. So we decided to form a group of our own and started planting signs around town that said, Vote to close the library August 2nd. Book burning party August 5th. The idea of book burning is bad enough, but gleefully making it a party, well, that angered people enough to send them to our Facebook page. You people are sick. This is disgusting. Reject the wackos. Vote yes. But we didn't stop there. We created videos. Imagine this times 200,000. How cool is that? Posted on Twitter. The Troy Library might be short on money, but it has books to burn. Created items for sale. A book bag. How ironic. We placed newspaper ads, created check-ins, posted flyers, and lined up entertainment. You guys are booking a band? People became enraged. Why would you burn books, idiots? This is horrible. Cheap imbeciles. What the f is this world coming we to? We should burn your signs instead. Complete and total this idiots. Really this is just down. That. Jerks. They posted their own links, shared with friends, debated the merits of libraries and the audacity of burning books. 
The conversation spread from Facebook to city council meetings, from newspapers to TV. It grew from local to national, even international news. Once it reached a fevered pitch, we revealed the true intent of our campaign. A vote against the library is like a vote to burn books. And people started posting, tweeting, and reporting all over again. In the end, we had changed the conversation completely, from taxes, 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 to library, library, library. And on August 2nd, the yes voters, voters who don't normally turn out to vote, turned out at levels 342% greater than projected. And the library won by a landslide. The town's library, its beautiful, award-winning library, had been saved. Not every story at the library has a happy ending. Fortunately, this one did. Coca-Cola would create momentum. It utilized unpaid media. You wouldn't be afraid to, to be controversial and take challenges and make change. And finally, what if Coca-Cola did sexual health? What would they do? Now, for many years, I worked on sexual health projects around the globe. And the one thing that was consistent is if I asked people, why didn't you use a condom? They would say, I don't want to lose momentum. I didn't want to lose the moment, basically, and fiddle about putting on a condom. If Coca-Cola did sexual health, maybe they would create this project. Hello, my name is Jacob. People think I don't use the condom, but as a matter of fact, I do. I'm just so super quick. Shower time. Run the condoms! So they would create a project that reduced the barrier, that reduced that loss of momentum and that loss of the moment, and make using protection even easier. These examples I've shown you, they're actually social marketing examples. So social marketing uses all the tools and techniques of companies like Coca-Cola, of commercial marketing, but they use them for social good. They use them to increase demand for goods and services, but ultimately social marketing is focused on behavior change. Because with public health, if we want to achieve our goals, we have to change people's behavior. It's no point raising demand for carrots if people don't eat those carrots, or raising demand for condoms if people just carry them in their wallet and not use them. So ultimately, social marketing is a tool that can help you impact on behavior, create demand for products and services, and then impact on behavior, which ultimately impacts on our public health outcomes. And as um, a book in social marketing it says, why should the devil have all the best tunes? Why can't we utilize this understanding and this knowledge from the commercial companies, but use it for public good? But there is three things that all those examples that I've just shared with you have in common. First is they are all based on a deep customer understanding of the target audience. They know what moves and what motivates the target audience. They know how to get the target audience to react positively or negatively as the case may be and achieve behavior change. It's really important that we do this before we develop any messages or any interventions. We've got to make sure that we see the world through our target audience's eyes. Now, some of you might look at this image and first see the young lady, or you might see the old lady first. I always see the old lady first, but I think most people see the young lady. Um, my husband always says it's because I'm getting old. That's why I see the old lady first. Uh, maybe there's some truth with that. But it's the same data, but if you look at it through different eyes, you interpret it differently. So that's why with all those programs, they try to understand the world through their target audience's eyes. Just in case anybody can't see the old lady and the young lady, with the old lady, 
it's the young lady's chin that is the old age old lady's nose and the young lady's necklace her choker necklace is the old woman's mouth so hopefully you can see um both the second thing those projects that i showed you always do is they offer an exchange they understand that there are benefits of doing negative behaviors so I always say to public health professionals, well, what's the benefit of smoking? And they look at me in shock and they say, but there is no benefit of smoking. Well, that's true. There's no health benefits for smoking, but there are benefits. Young people smoke because it might make them look cool. Other people might smoke because it helps them relax and unwind. So there are always benefits of negative behavior. I've done alcohol projects in the UK, the US and the Ukraine. Actually, that's, that's a lot of U's. I've just twigged that that's a lot of U's. What is consistent in those U countries is that when we ask young people, why do you binge drink? They say, well, it makes me feel more confident. It makes me feel sexy and you know, more able to go out and socialize and engage with people mostly of the opposite sex. And we want young people to feel confident and sexy. We want them to feel that. We just don't want them to feel that with alcohol. We want them to feel that in a different way. Formula milk is again consistent in so many countries that I've worked. When I ask mothers, why do you use formula milk? They all know that breast milk is best. They've been told that breast is best. And yet they'll say, formula milk is easier and more convenient because I'm so tired. And if I formula feed the baby, somebody else can feed and burp the baby. But if I'm breastfeeding, it's just me that can feed the baby. Or they'll say, actually, I'm embarrassed to breastfeed in public. I don't want to breastfeed in public. But because I'm breastfeeding, I have to stay at home all the time. So I'm lonely. Or I hear it an awful lot. Well, I was breastfed and look at me, I'm fine. I grew to be five foot seven. So actually it doesn't affect the baby. So there's always benefits of the negative behavior. And if you want people to change their behavior, you have to give them something better or at least as good. You have to replace those benefits, give them those benefits in another way. How can you make young people feel confident and sexy? without alcohol? How can you make young people feel cool without cigarettes? Very simply, all those projects that I shared with you, they increase the benefits and reduce the barriers. The Save the Crab project increased the benefits. You get to eat this delicious crab in hot melted butter. The Pronto condoms reduced the barrier and made it quicker and easier to put on a condom. The final thing they all have in common is that they utilize the whole intervention mix. It's mo lots more than just an advert. They think, how can they support the desired behavior change? Is there products and services they can develop which will make behavior change easier? And that's the Pronto Condom one for sure. Design, can they change the physical environment to improve the adherence to the new behavior? So for example, we know that in an obesity epidemic that we have in the UK, if you give people smaller plates, they actually feel fuller earlier because psychologically they've piled their plate up and they've eaten the food, but they now feel full. Or if you want people to drive slower, they put road humps. That's a design thing, a, a change to the physical environment. They inform and educate people, but not about facts and figures. They tell people about the benefits they're gonna get from changing their behavior. They create emotional attachment to that behavior change, like you saw with the Embrace Life car safety video. Control, well, Often you don't see this because this is kind of behind the scenes, but they work and they lobby to make legislation and policy changes 
who actually also incentivize the behavior change, but disincentivize the negative behavior. So make it as hard as possible for people to, for example, smoke. So just finally to give you an example of this in practice. You might look at this picture and think, now where could that be? Could it be maybe Mexico or could it be South America somewhere? Actually, this picture is from Dallas, Texas in the USA. Now, in Dallas, Texas, they were, the Department of Transport there were looking at the fatalities, the, sadly the infant fatalities from car crashes. And when they looked at the Hispanic population group compared to other population groups, the Hispanic population groups had far higher child and infant fatalities because of car accidents than any other group. So at first, they did the traditional health promotion type initiatives and they created leaflets and posters telling people that by law, they must have car seats for their children and the dreadful impact that could happen if they didn't have a car seat, you know, the, the normal ones where you see the baby flying through into the window and stuff like that. It had no impact on the behavior change. Then they gave away free car seats. And again, no impact. People took the car seats, but they didn't put them in the car. They put them in front of the TV for the children to have a comfortable seat whilst watching TV. And it's only when other things had failed did they decide to do a social marketing approach. And they gained that customer understanding. And this is what they found out. My child is always safest in my arms. That's what mothers believed. So you can see why those messages just wouldn't impact on their belief systems. And God decides when to take my baby. So they were very fatalistic, uh, Catholic religion. So based on this, they developed their intervention mix. They created a service. And the service was priests blessing car seats. So using holy water to bless car seats. Now in the Catholic faith, many people would believe that priests are, I suppose, the closest you can get to God on earth maybe, and they go to church a lot. This group of Hispanics um, went to church. It was the social norm. Every Sunday they would go to church with their friends and family. What would happen is after church, they would go into the car park and the priest would bless the car seats and say a prayer. And then the car seats would be physically put into their cars. So from a fun, easy and popular point of view, it ticks all the boxes. The messages were not about car fatality, road fatality. Instead, it was about you're doing what's expected in the eyes of the church. And in the way car seat clips around your baby, this is like God putting his arms around your child. So if we think, oh, have you just lost my slides? Let me go back. Sorry. So if you think about it from a support point of view, that was the service, the priest direct, directly breasts in the car seat. <coughs> From a design point of view, that was the car seats that um, reached all the safety standards we need them to reach. In form, we've already discussed. And from a control point of view, well, there was always fines for non-compliance. It was always the law that you should do this. But actually, they also did a subsidy for car seats because through their research, they realized that actually people don't always value free products. So they sold um, the car seats for a discounted price so that people valued them more. But it was still affordable. And the impact, well, was very positive. The impact was an increase in car seat usage from 21 to 73 percent very quickly within the first few months that happened and after a year it was something like 92 percent compliance so incredibly positive impact 
And I think if you take a social marketing approach, you can create programs, products and services that help people overcome the barriers and add benefits that they actually care about. So I will leave you with this thought. If Coca-Cola did COVID prevention work, I wonder how well they do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rowena. Uh, I think the, the downside of Zoom is that you can't hear a lot of people clapping for you at the moment, <laughs> saying we appreciate this. Really excellent. And thanks so much for your insights. Um, I wanted to just remind everybody that if you have questions, you just type those in the Q&A feature of Zoom, or if you prefer, you could do the chat. The Q&A is just easier for us to manage. And then Maximilian and I will read those questions to Rowena. So to get started, we have questions coming in, but I, what I would like to ask you first, Rowena, is because you've got experience with so many different um, settings and target audiences, stakeholders, and also governments. Um, whenever you get some, maybe some pushback for doing social marketing, you know, we don't have the time to do it right, or our experts know best, and so we don't need to go to the target audience and get that feedback because we know the science and we know what we're doing. We're communication experts, we're behavioral experts. What are some of the arguments that you could provide them to convince them to maybe do things a little differently as you've, as you've illustrated to us so well and so vividly here today in this presentation? Oh, yeah, I, I get that a lot. And, and because people want a magic bullet, they want a quick fix. And when it comes to behavior change, there is no quick fix. If there was a quick fix, we would have done it by now. And I, and I think that's one of my arguments. So normally I'm only bought in when everything else has failed. So for example, when I was brought into the project in Ukraine, they tried lots of other initiatives and they hadn't really impacted on alcohol consumption. They thought, well, let's try a social marketing approach. So often I say, well, what have you tried before? And we go through what they've tried and we discuss the pros and cons and if it's worked or not. And then we come to the conclusion, um, me leading them, but ultimately them coming to the conclusion that this really hasn't worked. And for us to do something different, it's to also acknowledge that in the past we must have done something wrong. So I say, look, just give me a month. And in that month, I will collect that customer understanding. And with that, I'll discuss with you how that relates to the projects you've done in the past. And then let's go. And I take them step by step. I don't say, look, you're going to be lumbered with me for two years whilst I go through this social marketing process. But in the reality, they are lumbered with me for two years. But I say, just sign up for a month. Let's take it step by step. And then let's see. Or I often get ministers when they look at the communication materials saying, oh, I don't like that picture or I don't like that. Um, I want that to be pink or I want that to be blue. And I say, OK, I understand um, your issues with this. Let's pre-test it with the target audience and then I'll bring their feedback and mix your feedback and their feedback and let's come with a solution. Um, so I think it, it's very much taking them on a journey and not coming in saying, I'm going to solve it or you're going to be stuck with me for years. It's taking them on that process um, journey, basically. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask Maximilian to, to address some of the questions in the Q&A. Maximilian? Yes, thank you. Rowena, we have a question for you. Based on the assumption that we are not rational, but we rely on our emotions, how is it possible that pregnant women just do not quit smoking? Why do they do not rely on their love for their babies and just quit smoke? And in case we need to build a social marketing campaign, is it possible that by using a social marketing which triggers fear for their babies is better than a positive one? So, I think, again, this is pretty consistent. I've worked on smoking in pregnancy in a number of countries now and also alcohol in pregnancy in a number of countries. In relation to smoking, there are some consistent insights that always come across from the data when I do interviews with the pregnant smokers. The first is that they already feel shame and they already feel guilty. So by showing them these hard-hitting, um, controversial images, 
this makes them feel even worse about themselves. You know, in an ideal world, they kind of say, we know we would quit. We want to quit. But it's just so hard to quit. The other two things that come out is um, often with pregnant smokers, um, they find that actually smoking gives them a little bit of me time. They find that healthcare professionals are constantly talking to their bump and not thinking about them. That's what they complain to me. And so they say that actually tobacco gives me a bit of me time. It gives me a bit of time away, maybe from my other kids or just peace and quiet. They normally go outside to smoke. It gives me that me time. I can, I can play Candy Crush on my phone and have a cigarette. So I can have five minutes out of the day. Um, and often they have very chaotic, difficult lives as well. Some of the people who continue to smoke during pregnancy. And actually people have said to me, it's my one luxury. So the, may, the success I've had with smoking in pregnancy was a project I did quite early on. And basically, we, we took that insight and we developed a new service. And it was a stop smoking service, but we didn't market it as that. We said, basically, come and have a cup of tea with us. Come and have a chat. Have a, you know, come with your neighbours, come with your friends. And we did do some stop smoking counselling. But we also had a creche so they could leave their children in the creche and we could give them peace and quiet whilst they had a cup of tea. And we did them, it was very popular at the time to have long nails, like nail art in the UK at the time. So we painted their nails, we gave them manicures, we trained people who had successfully quit smoking in, in basic beauty skills so they could do hand massages and neck massages. So basically we created a service where they could come and relax and enjoy themselves. And then very subtly, we talked to them about quitting smoking. Now, when we piloted this, we piloted it on a, a housing estate in a very deprived part of the northwest of England. And actually, it was really positive, the impact. They, um, I think they'd gone from 23 quitters, so people who um, make a commitment and remain quit for four weeks, to 121 within a year which doesn't sound a huge number, but it was a small population group. So we were really positively, um, we were really pleased with that basically, because smoking is hard. So in relation to that, I, I really don't think fear and just talking about the baby is enough. It's about understanding why they smoke and the benefits they get from smoking and basically give them those benefits in a different way. Thank you, Rowena. We have another question from Erin Fagerholm. How can we balance between maintaining long-term public trust and use of deception to achieve a short-term goal, as in the library example? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I think with the library example, it was different in that the behavior we wanted was a one-off non-divisible behavior. We wanted people to go and vote once. It was a clear black and white type behavior. You vote or you don't vote, you vote yes or no, basically. So I think that deception works there. But most of behaviors you work on in public health, you have to create sustainable behavior change because they're not one-off behaviors. I don't want people to quit smoking for one day. I want them to quit for life. So I think that deception um, works best when you have this very short-term goal and a very clear one-off non-divisible behaviour. I don't think it would work for the long-term sustainability because you would lose trust. Um, so I think you have to work out the right timing. You could though use it um, to kind of trigger people's interest. So sometimes I've done it before that I've done something a bit controversial as a teaser campaign before I've launched my main social marketing program. So you could do it that, but I think it's just a short term strategy. Thank you. Now we have another question from one of your students. How can we do social media marketing for products for nutrition or self-care devices which will be useful to community, but there is no demand for it currently, or there is no awareness? 
Um, so using just social, um, so social media is just a tiny element of social marketing, you know, and, and in the same way that promotion is just a tiny element of social marketing um, or commercial marketing. If we just focus on promotion, it would be like Kentucky Fried Chicken saying we've got the most amazing new chicken burger and you can buy it for one euro at um, our restaurant and then you go to the restaurant and it's not there. So I think whenever we're looking at healthy food promotion, first you need to make sure that the product is in place, that the supply is in place, and it's presented in a format that people will want to demand it. You know, those baby carrots, if they've been in a big bag and you had to wash and scrub them yourself, you wouldn't buy them. It's because they were in a cool packaging, um, in a vending machine, etc. So I think for me, that social media element only works when you've got your product, your price and your place, you might say, in line. And then you use the social media promotion element to promote those benefits that people get from eating baby carrots or um, more chicken or whatever you're trying to promote. But it's got to be the benefits as the target audience perceives them, as opposed to how you perceive them. So as soon as you start talking about nutrition, gosh, you lose people. Honestly, I work in nutrition, but as soon as I sit down with a nutritionist and they start talking vitamins and minerals, I glaze over and start planning my next coffee. So I think it, it, it's the same principles apply for healthy eating as, as for any of them. Thank you. Uh, another question from Mike Nzini. How can we deal with the difference of interest among people in communities? For example, youth have other interests from older people. What is your experience in creating demand that cover the whole society in this situation instead of making different interventions for different groups? I know this is not the answer you want, but the answer is you can't. There is not one product, one message, um, one service that will appeal to everyone. Commercial companies don't do it and, and I can't do it. We can't do it in social marketing. You have to recognize that there will be different segments in society and those different segments will be motivated by different things. Now, saying that, in public health, we often segment, we often divide up population groups just based on geographical location, so they live in a rural area versus an urban area, or we segment by demographics, so gender, age, etc. But in social marketing, we segment further. We segment by psychographics, so that's your attitudes, values, beliefs, and we segment by behaviour, by current behaviour. Now, if you segment by psychographics and current behaviour, it might be that an old person and a young person actually have the same attitude towards the behaviour. And so um, then it's not so much based on old versus young, it's just that they have consistent attitudes, beliefs, etc. So normally I would say you can't create a product that will appeal to everyone. You can't. But you can create products um, that appeal to a whole range of population groups if you base it on those psychographics and those behaviours as opposed to just saying young people think this and old people think that because that's, that's just not right. They might have some of the same views and attitudes on, on things in relation to your problem that you're trying to address. Thank you, Rowena. We have now a comment coming from the chat from Aira. Who, wrote, uh, who writes, great presentation. Thank you, Rowena. We are doing development need to think differently about communication and advocacy. Perhaps this is where public-private partnerships come in. Do you have any examples where development sector has worked with private sector to do successful behavior change? So, yeah, so, and, and I think this is something that evolving all the time. Um, so many years ago, there was something called the Red Campaign that was done 
and by commercial companies around basically HIV awareness and prevention, etc. So there are examples, um, old and new, even with the Change for Life campaign that was done in the UK around obesity, um, we still have the third highest obesity rate in, the, in um, Europe. So many of you might think, well, that actually doesn't work, um, which is probably a fair comment and we still need to do more. But even with that change for life, there was a lot of partnership working with, of course, the big supermarkets. Because if we want them to put products differently, if we want them to supply different products, etc., so that was a lot of partnership work. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different examples. And actually, um, with my role with the World Food Programme, we're looking at developing that further as well, because we recognise that these big issues, such as obesity, you just can't tackle by yourself. You need to develop effective public-private partnerships to tackle these big issues. So the supply and demand is kind of streamlined. Thank you. Now we have another question from one, one other of your students. Uh, what is the most difficult or even least successful social marketing project that you have been involved in? Why do you think it was that hard? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so the one that comes to mind was a project I did in South Sudan. And the funders wanted the project to address gender-based violence issues. Now, gender-based violence is incredibly high and rates are very high in South Sudan. There's lack of a legal system to deal with perpetrators, etc. So that there's many kind of um, faults within the system. But I think what was um, a real eye opener for me was when I was interviewing the key informants. So I was interviewing religious leaders and village chiefs. And we were talking about gender based violence within their communities. And the religious leaders said to me, gosh, yes, rape is dreadful. We frown on rape. We preach that you shouldn't rape um, people. That's really bad. Um, unless you're disabled, and if you're disabled, then rape actually isn't that bad because it's the only way they can have a child. But actually, for a disabled woman, rape could be quite good because they get a baby that way. And I remember sitting there um, <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it that I was hearing this. And I thought, if that's your religious leaders and your community leaders saying this, I don't know what I can do. And I remember going back into um, Juba, the capital of South Sudan, and having a meeting with the donor. And they said, so Rowena, what can we do? And I said, do you know what? I have no idea. I, I really don't know what you should do because that's such an extreme view coming from your key influences. I think you just have to take really baby steps and just every day kind of do something do a tiny bit more engagement with these religious leaders etc and very 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 slowly you'll change behavior but if you want me to come up with an intervention mix that's going to impact on gender-based violence in the in the next six months which was their goal i can't do that it's not going to happen i'm sorry but it's not going to happen so i think that was the project where I said, I can't do what you want me to do. And I had to walk away from it because I just couldn't achieve their aims um, when I was coming up with those views. Okay, thank you, Rowena. I think we have time for the last question from Duarte Brito. As you showed us, many public health interventions are not really directed to target behavior change. What are your suggestions for public health professionals most without social marketing training, to develop behavioral research previous to an intervention project, taking into account time and money restraints? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so basically, there's an awful lot of research already out there, which will give us key insights into why people do certain behaviors and why they don't, and their attitudes, etc. I think in public health, we've focused very much on the what and the how, 
And we often never ask those why questions, like why do you smoke? Why do you drink during pregnancy? Like what do you gain from it? But there is actually research out there that people can utilize. Um, there's various resources like the National Social Marketing Center, they have a whole resource section which has loads of case examples in their research from around the world. So there's lots of things you can utilize. And even though we like to think we're all unique and we're all different, and of course there are cultural differences between us, when it comes down to the actual individual behaviours, like I was saying with the breastfeeding, women say in, um, how it's more convenient, social, cultural reasons why they don't breastfeed. That's come from my research in the UK, in um, Gaza, in Hong Kong, etc. So they're from very diverse cultural groups. And yet, actually, the reasons why they don't breastfeed and the reasons why they formula feed are 99% the same. A, a ma the only major difference between the UK mothers and the mothers in Gaza and in Hong Kong was in the UK, we didn't care what our mother-in-laws said. So in fact, if our mother-in-laws said, use formula milk, we'd be more likely to breastfeed. Um, but actually in Gaza and Hong Kong, the mother-in-laws had much more influence on women's decisions to formula feed. So that's the only difference. So you can take existing research, utilize it for your own projects, and then just do a small piece of new research to check the generalizability of the findings within the culture you're working in. Thank you very much, Rowena. Um, we still have several questions in the Q&A feature, but unfortunately we're out of time. So I wanted to just notify those who've asked questions, we can answer those questions for you outside of the chat. Many of you are enrolled in the course, so you'll learn more today and tomorrow. And those of you who are not, will reach out to you with answers to that. They're mainly questions about really how to get more information, how to learn more about this. So thank you very much, incredibly inspiring. Um, and I hope that the, the take home message is here that, you know, if we're focusing on, on really changing and supporting behaviors is that we have to meet people where they are versus actually imposing what we think they should, where we think they should be. Thank you very much. I wish you all a fantastic rest of day or good evening, wherever you are, and remind you that if you want to see this again, or if you want to share this with your friends, families, coworkers, your Ministry of Health, that this is on YouTube, on the SSPH Plus YouTube channel, and it will remain there for ever, I guess, <laughs> until we take it down. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Rowena. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.